some events leave a deep mark on history, but none on the land. This is the site of the Battle of Hastings. After almost a thousand years, no traces of the bloody conflict can be seen. But here, the fate of England turned. It's where a king was killed and his victor claimed the throne. October 14th, 1066. We know what happened here on this day, thanks to this. The Bayer Tapestry. A carefully preserved illustrated record of events. It shows the main players. Harold, the newly crowned Anglo-Saxon King of England, and his challenger, William. Duke of Normandy. William claimed the previous king had promised him the crown. So, he assembled an army and prepared to sail to England to fight King Harold for the throne. But a storm thwarted his plans. Meanwhile, Harold discovered that a Viking invasion had landed in the north another threat to his crown, so he raced to fight them. In France, William waited for the right conditions to sail across the Channel to England. The weather cleared. He seized his chance. Two hundred and fifty miles north, Harold had defeated the Vikings. Now, hearing of William's arrival, his army sped south. At nine o'clock in the morning, on this hill, William's Norman army were ready to do battle with Harold's Anglo-Saxon men. The stage was set, and up for grabs, England itself. Battle of Hastings, the death of one man changed the course of history. The Anglo-Saxon King Harold was killed here, on England's south coast. His army defeated by William of Normandy. Anglo-Saxon rule was over forever. At Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066, William was crowned the first Norman King of England. Now he had to secure power across the country. He began by stamping his mark on the landscape, building cathedrals and castles at strategic locations. Nothing like them had been seen in England before. They reminded the Anglo-Saxon population exactly who was in charge. But not all were content with living under Norman rule. Anglo-Saxon revolts broke out across the country. King William acted quickly to crush these rebellions. But there was one region where dissent was spiraling out of control. The north of England. In 1069, a group of lords from Northumbria formed an alliance with Viking invaders. Together they approached Norman-held York, a large city with an important cathedral, still protected by ancient Roman walls. But the walls couldn't save York. The city and the castle fell to the rebels. William's new kingdom was under threat. He had to get the city back under Norman control. 
William had no choice but to order his men north. But as the Norman forces set off on their long march towards York, how much resistance from the rebels would they encounter? William the Conqueror had recaptured York from the rebels. Now he wanted to teach them a lesson for defying him. He began a brutal campaign of destruction to crush any further resistance, known as the harrying of the North. Villages and crops were destroyed. It is said 100,000 people were killed. With ruthless efficiency, William the Conqueror had secured obedience in his new kingdom. But it wasn't to last. It would be thrown into chaos by his own children. When William the Conqueror died in 1087, his favorite son succeeded him. King William II, known as William Rufus. But 13 years into his reign, disaster struck. While out hunting, he was killed. William's youngest brother took his place as King Henry I. But there was a problem. At the time, Henry's elder brother, Robert, Duke of Normandy, had been on crusade. When he returned, he was furious that Henry had grabbed the throne. From Normandy, Robert attempted to invade England to claim the crown from his brother. But he failed and returned home. In retaliation, Henry struck back. In a reversal of 1066, he crossed the Channel and invaded Normandy, intent on undermining his brother Robert's rule. His first target was Bayer. This rich and splendid city was one of the jewels of Normandy. Henry was to begin his campaign by unleashing his forces on the city. Bayer was about to feel the wrath of the English army. While Bayer burned, King Henry pressed his advantage. Seizing key fortifications and buying the loyalty of powerful lords, Henry loosened his brother's grip over Normandy. At Tinchebray in 1106, brother would fight brother for final claim to their father's lands. William the Conqueror's sons had resolved their long feud over Normandy, with King Henry wresting possession away from his brother. But the French King Louis VI would not accept Henry's heir as the future Duke of Normandy. Henry's fragile power would face its first test, an invasion by the French king. After England defeated the French at the Battle of Brimuel, Normandy was back in King Henry's hands. But one year later, his good fortune turned to tragedy. In 1120, his son and heir, William Adeline, died in a shipwreck. The future of Henry I's kingdom was in jeopardy. Henry desperately needed a new heir. With no legitimate sons left alive, he broke with tradition and chose his daughter, Matilda. Henry forced his barons to swear an oath to accept Matilda as queen. 
But when the king died, they broke their promise. England would not be ruled by a woman. Matilda's cousin Stephen saw his chance and claimed the throne. The crisis moved to the capital. At Westminster Abbey, Stephen was crowned king, but Matilda wanted what was hers. She was also lining up powerful supporters who would fight Stephen for her right to rule. Their conflict engulfed England in civil war. Fighting raged throughout the land. In 1141, everything focused on one of the kingdom's most strategic cities, Lincoln. Matilda's allies had commandeered the castle. But King Stephen was determined to take it back. He besieged the castle. Stalemate. As dawn broke on February the 2nd, everything was about to change. Matilda's half-brother, Robert of Gloucester, raced to break the siege. As Robert's forces approached Lincoln, Stephen's army turned away from the castle to face them. Robert could win Matilda the crown, but only if his army could win the day. Victory over King Stephen at Lincoln gave Matilda the upper hand in her fight for the English crown. But in the years that followed, Fragile loyalties shifted, and under threat of capture, Matilda was forced to retreat. As her holdings in England came under attack from the king's army, it fell to her son Henry to keep Matilda's claim to the throne alive. Wallingford, in the shadow of the castle. Matilda's faction, commanded by her son Henry, proved it was still willing to fight King Stephen for the crown. But after 15 years of conflict, both sides had had enough. So they made a deal. Matilda would surrender her claim to the throne on condition that when Stephen died, her eldest living son Henry would succeed him. A year later, he was crowned King Henry II and proceeded to grow the kingdom into the mighty Angevin Empire. But once again, what the king had spent his life building, his own children were destined to destroy. King Henry II had four surviving legitimate sons and he planned to divide up his kingdom between them. But they fought bitterly for dominance. Against the odds, Henry's youngest son, John, became king. But King John was deeply unpopular. He lost huge swathes of the Angevin Empire gained by his father, then failed to reclaim them in expensive battles. Paid for by taxing his subjects. Eventually, England's barons could take it no more. They forced John to agree to a charter that restricted his power. The Magna Carta. But he went against his word. Furious, they rebelled inviting Prince Louis of France to invade England. In 1216, Louis sailed to Dover and set his sights on taking this. Dover Castle. Held by forces loyal to King John, it was commanded by Hubert de Burgh. 
He described the castle as the key to England. He was right. If it fell to the French, so would the kingdom. In the year prior to the defense of Dover, King John's defiance of the Magna Carta had mired England in a rebellion known as the First Barons' War. Across England, barons broke ties with the crown and seized important cities, including Rochester. With his reign under threat, John deployed his forces to retake Rochester and capture the traitors. When forces loyal to King John undermined Rochester Castle, it spelled doom for the rebels inside. Within days, they had surrendered. But the rebel barons weren't done yet. Their ally, Prince Louis of France, had sent an invasion force to help the barons overthrow King John. Then, in late 1216, the king fell ill with dysentery and died. His son, just nine years old, was crowned King Henry III. It was now up to the young king's regent, the 70-year-old legendary knight William Marshall, to protect the crown. He faced a near impossible challenge. England was crumbling. Rebels were taking town after town. But William Marshall bided his time and prepared to defeat the rebels. Then in May 1217, he got the chance that he'd been waiting for. William discovered that the rebels planned to simultaneously besiege both Dover Castle and Lincoln Castle. With rebel forces split and weakened, William Marshall led his royalist army to Lincoln. The castle on one side of the city was still controlled by royalists, under its formidable constable, Lady Nicola de la Haye. But the streets of the city were under rebel control. On May 20th, 1217, the Royalist Relief Force, led by William Marshall, arrived to retake the rebel-controlled city. The future of England rode on the success of this mission. William Marshall's success in retaking Lincoln was an overwhelming victory for the Royalists. The rebel barons had been defeated, and their French allies driven out of England altogether. <laughs> William Marshall now focused on creating a stable kingdom for the young King Henry III. To maintain the backing of the rebels, in 1217, a royal seal of approval was given to a reissued Magna Carta, limiting the power of the monarchy. Many barons held lands in both England and Normandy. But now they faced a choice. On which side of the channel would they make their home? Many chose England. The cross-channel kingdom was over, establishing a clear English identity. But the impact of the Normans on England's evolution is still felt today. Almost a thousand years later, the surviving Norman castles and cathedrals still dominate the landscape.
In the midst of the modern city, William the Conqueror's fortress, the Tower of London, remains a powerful reminder of their legacy. But it's the unseen influence of the Normans that endures. The Norman invasion changed the English language and established the foundations of modern parliament and governance. And it's all because one man, William the Conqueror, claimed the English crown that he believed by rights was his. The Normans conquered a country and changed the course of England forever. In 1350, what we know as the idyllic French countryside was a living hell. For more than 15 years, the people had suffered at the hands of English invaders. Little did they know that this war would last for another 100 years. But through this crucible of fighting, famine and plague, there would emerge the modern nation of France. England's king, Edward III, looked jealously across the English Channel. Wanting France for his own, he had added the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, to his own royal standard. This was an all-out declaration of war. And in 1337, he invaded. But France already had a king, Philippe VI. As the English burned their way across the land, Philippe's army and his legendary knights marched to meet them and came face to face with the English longbow. A simple weapon, but the most devastating the knights had ever faced. The heroes of France fell to storms of English arrows. The war engulfed the French countryside. By 1351, the conflict was focused on Brittany. One fight stands out as a spectacular display of chivalry and a symbol of the wider conflict between the two enemy nations. The combat of the Thirty is still commemorated here in Brittany. It was a dispute between two local families Supported by the opposing sides in the war, the French and English commanders decided to settle it through a trial of knightly combat. Each side would choose 30 champions to fight on neutral ground. France prepared to defend itself against England's finest. After victory at the combat of the Thirty, the French faced devastating raids from England's Black Prince. But France's King John II was closing in. Jean finally caught the English near the city of Poitiers in September 1356. The French army outnumbered the English by thousands. King Jean himself joined the fight, but what seemed a certain victory for France soon turned into a nightmare. The English longbow devastated the mighty French army. An endless hail of arrows gutted the main French force. Then the English captured King Jean. The fight was over.
The Battle of Poitiers was another catastrophic defeat for the French. The English had destroyed most of France's nobility in a single day. Now they turned their attention towards taking the French capital, Paris. The invaders marched unopposed towards Paris. The remains of some of the medieval walls of Paris still stand today. As the English army approached, the terrified locals sought shelter behind these defences. Could France's capital withstand the full might of the Black Prince's army? The walls of Paris held out against the English onslaught. England's King Edward and the Black Prince abandoned the siege. They marched towards Chartres to try their luck at conquering a less formidable target. But before they could attack, a violent storm hit the army. killing a thousand English soldiers in a tempest of hail and freezing winds. To Edward, this Black Monday disaster seemed like divine retribution. A sign that it was time to stop waging war and make peace with France's King Jean. But even as peace between kings was reached, the people of France were still living in bloodshed and turmoil. Between 1358 and 1370, France was in chaos. Peasant uprisings, rampaging bands of mercenaries, and civil war ravaged the country. Peasants rose in rebellion, killing their lords and wreaking havoc. Mercenary bands also roamed the land. Known as Routier, they had once been hired by the English to fight against the French, but were cut loose when peace was reached. They systematically ravaged and pillaged towns across France. And with King Jean prisoner in England, his son Charles the Dauphin faced homegrown attacks on his rule by powerful French lords, beset from all sides. The Dauphin's forces had to regain control over their own country. With rebels and raiders eliminated at Cocherelle, King Charles V faced one last threat to France, the relentless English invaders. Word arrived that the English army was weak and scattered, divided by infighting. The king quickly directed his army to chase down the old enemy of France at Pont Valin. The French won an overwhelming victory at the Battle of Pont Valin. It was the first time the English had been utterly defeated during the war, but the triumph was short-lived. As England spent the next 60 years amassing French territory through alliances and victories at great battles such as Agincourt. It seemed that nothing could stop England. Who then? 
could have foreseen that a teenaged girl was about to change the course of history. In 1429, France was in dire straits. Nowhere was it more evident than the besieged city of Orléans. The city was completely surrounded by English-held forts. But just a few days' ride away, here in Chinon, there was potential help. The French royal prince, the Dauphin Charles, was holed up in his fortress and under pressure to ride out to save Orléans. As Charles hesitated, a young peasant girl arrived at his court. Her name was Jeanne d'Arc. She claimed to have received saintly visions, giving her a divine task to help Charles become king and drive the English out of France forever. Charles was skeptical, but was soon convinced of her divinity. And he charged the 17-year-old with the near impossible mission to liberate Orléans. To Jeanne, this was the first step in realizing her God-given destiny. In April 1429, she rode out from Chinon at the head of her army to confront the hated enemy of France. Jeanne d'Arc had liberated Orléans and put the English army to flight. However, as the English retreated, they became an obstacle for Charles the Dauphin. He needed a clear path from Chinon to Reims, where he would be crowned king. Nearing the town of Pate, the English sought to regroup. But Jeanne d'Arc and her French army were closing in. The Battle of Pate was a disaster for the English. The French wiped out their bowmen and drove their forces from the Loire Valley. Now for Jeanne d'Arc and the Dauphin, the way to Reims was clear. The Maid of Orléans rode with the Dauphin through the streets and was at his side when he was finally crowned King Charles VII of France. But less than two years later, Jeanne was captured in battle, sold to the English and put on trial for heresy. She spent six months locked in a dungeon awaiting her fate. King Charles, who owed his crown to Jeanne, did nothing to help win her freedom. She was found guilty. On May 30th, 1431, Jeanne d'Arc was brought here to the old market square in Rouen, where she was burned at the stake. She was 19 years old. But what the Maid of Orléans started could not be denied. Her victories were the first in a chain of successes for France's military. Liberty was within reach. Thanks to the leadership of two brothers, Jean and Gaspard Bureau, the French army became experts in the use of artillery, transforming it into a disciplined, modern fighting force. In 1448, King Charles was ready to make a major move against the English. He vowed to retake Normandy. Thanks 
after the explosive force of cannon fire, the French were close to victory in this century-long war. But in a final grasp at power, the English dispatched a fresh army equipped with their tried and tested longbows. Formigny would be a trial of old versus new to determine the fate of France. At Formigny, the roar of cannon fire sounded the death knell for England's ambitions in France. King Charles and the Bureau brothers did not let up on the offensive, and in 1453, the English retreated across the Channel. France was finally at peace. More than 100 years had passed since the first English chevauchés had scorched the land. The iconic French knights who fought in those early days would not have recognized their own military a century later. The English longbow, once the scourge of France, was no match for French artillery in the last years of the war. And by 1453, France's border looked very different, growing to encompass territories once claimed by England and their allies. After enduring a century of conflict, France emerged as a transformed nation. The country and its people had persevered and unified into a kingdom that could defend itself. Against all odds, France had won the Hundred Years' War. From the vast reaches of the Mongolian steppe, an army of over 100,000 men swept aside all resistance, claiming territories that spanned continents. Their leader, Genghis Khan, proclaimed his life's ambition was to unite the world under one empire. Having conquered the East, the Mongols turned their attention to the west, where they would come face to face with some of the greatest armies of medieval Europe. Would Genghis Khan's legendary warriors finally meet their match? By 1221, the Mongols had taken cities throughout Asia, generating vast amounts of tribute from those they conquered. The West, however, was still an untapped resource. Genghis Khan sent his trusted generals, Jebe and Subutai, to attack Europe. With an army of 20,000, Jebe and Subutai took the West by surprise raiding cities and destroying armies. Within two years, they had the prosperous Rus territories in their sights. But in their way was a Rus army of over 40,000 men. Outnumbered, Jebe and Subutai turned and started to head back east. The Rus sensed an easy victory and set off in pursuit of their retreating enemies. For eight days, the fast-moving Mongols stayed just out of reach. Then, 
Jebe and Subutai set their trap. They lured the Rus across the Kalka River and turned to fight. The Rus had fallen for one of the Mongols' most effective tactics, the feigned retreat. The stage was set for the Mongol army to test themselves against Europe's finest. On the banks of the Kalka River, thousands of Rus were killed by the Mongols. The hunters had become the hunted. But in the years leading up to this Mongol raid in the west, Genghis Khan had been focusing his attacks on the east and the Qin dynasty of northern China. Controlling wealthy lands and trade routes, Qin cities overflowed with riches. In 1210, the Qin's new ruler, seeing Genghis Khan as a threat, demanded that he swear loyalty to him. Genghis Khan refused. To the Qin, this defiance was a declaration of war. The Qin had a huge army, and their territory was protected by vast fortifications, known today as the Great Wall. The Mongols had never faced a more formidable enemy. Genghis Khan knew the only way to defeat the Qin would be to take their heavily defended capital city, Zhongdu, on the other side of the Great Wall. Genghis Khan would be committing his people to a long, hard war. Would the rewards be worth the cost? For answers, he looked to the gods. Climbing a sacred mountain, he prayed to the eternal sky. After four days, he received his answer. The Mongols would be victorious. With divine reassurance, the Mongol army set out across the steppe. They must break through the Great Wall to destroy the Qin dynasty and further expand the Mongol Empire. Genghis Khan had successfully breached the Great Wall of China. He led his forces to the greatest prize in the East, the capital city of Zhongdu. He besieged the city, knowing that its inhabitants could not hold out forever. On June the 1st, 1215, the city of Chengdu, known today as Beijing, fell to the Mongols. They looted the city, sending caravans loaded with luxuries back home. This victory over the Qin dynasty was to be one of Genghis Khan's greatest triumphs. After his death in 1227, his descendants continued the conquests, and his grandson, Batu Khan, had his eyes on the west. The Mongol raids of the 1220s had shown that the Rus lands held riches worth exploiting. The battles had devastated the Rus elite, and their defenses were weak. So Batu Khan organized an enormous invasion force, determined to turn the Rus lands into vassals of the Mongol Empire. The Mongols captured territory after territory. By 1240, they had their sights on the great city of Kiev. Kiev was a jewel among the Rus principalities, 
a center of scholarship, power, and wealth. Batu Khan's cousin, Monka, was put in command of the advance force, ready to attack. Chroniclers tell of Monka's admiration for the beauty of Kiev, so he was reluctant to destroy it. Monka sent his envoys to the city to demand its surrender. But Kiev's commander in charge refused and killed the Mongol envoys. Monka would not stand for such disrespect. His army rode to the city walls and prepared to attack. They would show Kiev no mercy. With Kiev secure, the Mongols planned a coordinated drive deeper into Europe. They would divide the forces of Poland and Hungary by attacking both kingdoms simultaneously. At Liegnitz, the old armies of Europe would be tested against Mongol-style warfare. While the Mongols in the north destroyed the Polish army, Batu Khan and General Subutai rampaged through the south into the heart of Hungary. Tricked into an intense pursuit, the Hungarian king chased down these foreign invaders all the way to the plains of Mohi. After a stunning victory over the Hungarian king at the Battle of Mohi, the Mongols seemed unstoppable. But a year later, the great Khan Ogaday died. The Mongols pulled out of Europe and returned home. Over the next 20 years, two more great Khans ascended to the throne. Their conquests continued to expand the empire in the east. Then in 1260, the grandson of Genghis became the next great Khan. His name was Kublai Khan. He would rock the foundations of one of the medieval world's most advanced civilizations, China. This is Shangdu. Remember today is Xanadu. It was once Kublai Khan's great northern capital. From here, he jealously eyed the wealth of southern China's Song Dynasty. He wanted to take it and become emperor of all China. The Song Dynasty had ruled over southern China for more than 300 years and the country was prosperous and well-governed. Kublai Khan knew that the key to victory was capturing a strategic city lying far to the south of Shangdu. It was called Changyong. Changyong was the gateway to the south and the heart of the Song Dynasty's power. Controlling the Han River, a critical access route to cities further along the Yangtze. Capturing Shangyong was Kublai Khan's only hope of becoming emperor of all China. The Mongol horde had to take the city at all costs. Twin cities did not yield. The Mongols would need a new tactic to breach the Great Song Fortress. Rather than another costly head-on assault, they planned to cut off the cities by blocking the critical supply route at Lumen Shan.
crippled by the loss of their supply route, the twin cities of Xiangyang and Fengcheng were ready to fall. The Mongols' new long-range trebuchets would test the mighty walls of the Song Fortress, and Kublai Khan would not stop the bombardment until he sat on the throne of all China. The Mongol army smashed through Xiangyang's defenses and captured the city. Kublai Khan then pursued the remnants of the Song dynasty across southern China. In 1279, at the Battle of Yamen, the Mongols destroyed the last defenders of the Song. Kublai Khan now ruled over all China, founding the Yuan dynasty. His royal court in Shangdu welcomed scholars, traders, and religious leaders. The Mongols demonstrated civility and religious tolerance, but also brutality and violence, typifying the contradictions within the Mongol Empire. Since Genghis Khan first united the Mongolian tribes, they had made incredible advances in technology and trade. And they created indelible connections between East and West. At its height, almost a hundred million people lived under Mongol rule, a quarter of the world's population. The Mongol Empire endured for less than 200 years before fragmenting into smaller territories, but its legend continues to this day. Genghis Khan's mission was to unite the world into one empire, yet he always returned to the Mongolian steppe where the endless grasslands lay beneath the eternal sky. And from where he created one of the largest empires the world has ever known. Today, Moscow is a metropolis of over 11 million people. But 800 years ago, it was a small village on the banks of the Moskva River. A modest settlement surrounded by simple wooden defenses. It gave little indication of its future greatness or its ability to evolve through adversity. Moscow was frequently attacked and destroyed. Yet each time, it rose from the ashes, stronger and better defended. Its first real test came in 1238. This time, they faced a new enemy, the Mongols. Moscow had been largely unaware of the growing threat in Central Asia. Genghis Khan, founder of the Great Mongol Empire, had conquered most of the Asian continent. His descendants continued his work to expand the empire. His grandson, Batu Khan, led the armies of what would become known as the Golden Horde. Their goal, to extract money from principalities they conquered. One by one, states in the region, known collectively as the Rus, 
fell to the Golden Horde. Moscow was next. In 1238, the Mongol Golden Horde surrounded Moscow and besieged its wooden walls. It would only hold out for five days. Moscow burned. That could have been the end of its story, but the people of Moscow were resilient. They would not give up their home or their control of the Moskva River, an important trade route. They began to rebuild and strengthen Moscow's defenses. Yet one question remained. Would the terror return? By 1303, Moscow controlled land that encompassed the entire flow of the Moskva River. Its ambitions didn't end there. Moscow continued to expand its borders through its wealth rather than warfare. Its tactic was to buy land from bankrupt rulers, acquiring entire towns and villages in the process. As Moscow was still a vassal of the mighty Mongol Empire, it had to send envoys to pay them tribute. And Moscow's ever-expanding borders meant more and more revenue for the Mongols. But not everyone was content with the rise of Moscow. As Moscow grew in power and influence, its grand prince, Dmitry Ivanovich, reinforced its vulnerable defenses. Its wooden fortress, the Kremlin, was rebuilt. This time, in stone. But even stone walls didn't deter its enemies. By 1368, Lithuania saw rapidly expanding Moscow as a real threat. Joining forces with the Principality of Tver, they set out to challenge its dominance. They attacked Moscow. But the stone walls held, and the enemy retreated. Tension between the factions refused to die down. In 1370, Moscow marched on territories belonging to both Tver and Lithuania, igniting a full-blown war. Years of bloody conflict ensued, until Moscow's Grand Prince Dmitry Ivanovich finally defeated both enemies. Yet Moscow was still a vassal of the Mongol Empire, which still demanded tribute. Moscow must keep up the payments, or face retribution. Under Grand Prince Dmitry, Moscow had grown rich and allied itself with old adversaries. Together, the Rus allies were ready to challenge the dominance of the Mongols and stopped paying them tribute. On the banks of the River Don, Dmitry would stake his life on being the first Rus leader to defeat the Horde in battle. On the morning of September 8, 1380, at Kulikovo, the Moscow-led Rus army defeated the Mongols for the first time. One of the key battles of the medieval age, it was a transformative event in the rise of Moscow as the future capital of Russia. 
For the first time, rival principalities had joined Moscow to fight a common enemy. Now, many Rus principalities began to see themselves as one. Future leaders of Moscow would draw on the memory of this battle to claim their supreme political position in Russia. Moscow's Grand Prince, Dmitry Ivanovich, had led the Rus principalities to victory over the Mongols, reinforcing his dominance. But for the Mongols' leadership, the defeat at the Battle of Kulikovo was disastrous. The ruler of their Golden Horde was overthrown by a descendant of Genghis Khan. His name was Toktamish. And Toktamish was not going to let the treacherous Moscow-led Rus get away with rebellion. Two years after their defeat at Kulikovo, Toktamish's Golden Horde set out to attack Moscow. The city had not felt the wrath of the Mongols for more than a century. That was about to change. In the century following the Mongols' vengeful attack on Moscow, Dmitry Donskoy's son and grandson clung to the Rus' throne. Amid old rivalries and fragile alliances, Dmitry's great-grandson Ivan III set out to consolidate Moscow's control over all the Rus. But one independent republic would not yield to Moscow, the wealthy commercial center of Novgorod. While Ivan III consolidated Moscow's power, the Golden Horde was succumbing to discord. Seizing on this weakness, Ivan withheld tribute, equipped his men with firearms, and marched to meet the army of the Khan. On the banks of the Ugra River, the Rus stood defiant, prepared to contest over 200 years of Mongol dominance. In 1480, Moscow's army, led by Ivan III, faced off against the Mongols across the banks of the Ugra River. But the Muscovites, armed with guns, were too much for the Mongol army. When the Mongols realized reinforcements weren't coming, they retreated. Now Ivan III was free to pursue his ambitions to expand Moscow even further. Despite the rapid rise of Moscow, it was still a vassal of the Mongol Empire. But after the stand at the Ugra River, Ivan III's ongoing refusal to pay tribute antagonized the Mongols. Yet, retribution never came. Cracks had developed in the highest levels of Mongol rule, and the Golden Horde shattered into smaller carnates, beset by infighting. So Moscow was left free to expand. Ivan III continued taking control of smaller Rus principalities by any means necessary. Some had been ruled for over 100 years by an historic enemy, Lithuania. Ivan III was determined to take them back. By 1500, he had turned Moscow 
into more than just a city or a state. It was an entity that he claimed represented all the Rus people. Ivan's successor, Vasily III, would fight to take back the lands from Lithuania that he believed belonged to Moscow. Following Moscow's growth in the West, Ivan IV ascended the throne and took up the eastern expansion plans of his ancestors. The Tatar Khanate of Kazan lay just across the border. But the Tatars had resisted many Rus sieges in the past. In his final attempt to capture the Tatar lands, Ivan would deploy bold new strategies. Ivan IV had broken through the walls of the ancient city of Kazan, and his army flooded the streets. They hunted down its defenders and their allies, and brutally sacked the city. Kazan had fallen to the unstoppable military might and strategic innovation of the Muscovite war machine. In the years that followed, Ivan IV waged war after war to bring vast new territories under Moscow's rule. By 1547, he had declared himself the first Tsar of all Russia. And his never-ending fight for territory set the course for those who ruled after him. Moscow was no longer a small fort on the banks of the Moskva River. It had survived centuries of Mongol oppression and wars with its neighbors. Its evolution from fort to city to state and to empire would continue. Moscow's rise transformed Russia into one of the world's greatest superpowers.